All right, so welcome back to our CCI Mentorship Program. In this lesson, we are going to now focus on some of the introductory troubleshooting techniques that we're going to be using for OSPF. Uh, now, what I will say as a preface to this discussion is that, uh, sorry, we already did that lesson, troubleshooting OSPF adjacencies. What I will say uh, with regard to this particular topic is that there are many, many different things that could force adjacencies within OSPF to fail. And uh, uh, for example, you might have stub area misconfigurations or you've got some sort of redistribution problem uh, you know, that's, that's going to uh, disallow us from uh, exchanging our, our, our state tables between our OSPF peers and so on. So I'm not going to be discussing every single troubleshooting aspect in this particular case. We're going to hit some of the high level ones and talk a little bit about and kind of add on to what we were discussing previously with regard to uh, troubleshooting adjacencies and so on. And we'll do a little break fix, a couple of break fix scenarios in this particular case, uh, because that's essentially what you're going to have to be doing on the troubleshooting section within the CCIE lab. And uh, because OSPF is such a complicated routing protocol, and because it has so many kind of different caveats and different variables that, uh, that would be included in, in not only the configuration, but uh, the synchronization of the configuration between peers and so on, uh, it's going to be kind of a multifaceted discussion with regard to troubleshooting OSPF. So this is our lesson. We're going to be doing a troubleshooting of OSPF uh, and we'll be using this topology in this particular case uh, to provide for that troubleshooting. This is actually a topology that we're going to use uh, for quite a few of our lessons because it really does allow us to configure quite a few things. We might add some elements to the configuration. Uh, for example, when we're doing uh, special area types with ASBRs, we'll have to add an ASBR. But this is pretty much the topology that we're going to be using. In the, uh, this topology is in the, uh, uh, I'm using traditional IOU, or excuse me, IOS for this topology uh, because it was already pre-built from a previous exercise. Uh, and it's in the Google Drive. You guys can get access to that in the Google Drive if you want to go ahead and go through the lesson. All right. So we're going to be talking about troubleshooting OSPF adjacencies. Uh, we're going to take another look at the OSPF state machine. Uh, you know, the, the uh, down, the init, the xstart, the exchange, the loading, and the full. I forgot the two-way in there. But we're going to be talking about the state machine. And then we're also going to be taking a look at how we can interpret some of the show commands, certainly some of the debug commands that we would use to verify adjacency issues. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of attributes need to match, uh, what needs to be unique in order for adjacencies to come up between these different peers. There are certain attributes that, uh, unlike EIGRP, in OSPF, those attributes have to match in order for us to form an adjacency. And then there's also attributes that have to be unique in order for us to be able to either form an adjacency or at least synchronize our, our topology database. All right. So uh, one of the things that we need to understand from the perspective of configuring and implementing OSPF is obviously the different types of designs that we have, either single area or multi-area. In this case, we're running a multi-area design because I do want to show you a couple of things with regard to how routes are disseminated in a multi-area design. We will actually have another complete lesson that talks about multi-area design and different LSA types and so on. Uh, but we have to be able to define very quickly in the lab scenario, is this going to be a layer one problem? Is it going to be a layer two problem? Maybe it's a layer three problem or a transport problem. Uh, OSPF is not a, does not utilize a transport layer mechanism like RIP or BGP, but there could be some elements of our configuration that are preventing OSPF peers from forming a relationship. So we're going to take a look at some of the useful troubleshooting tools that we have in, uh, in OSPF and uh, so on. So let's start by just simply taking a look at our topology configuration, make sure that we have a, a good, uh, a, a, you know, a, a complete topology and that everything is converged in this particular case. And then we'll go back and start to break things and, and kind of look at what the symptoms are for those different scenarios. And then how do we find that on the lab quickly 
how do we fix it? One of the things that you're going to find about the troubleshooting section of the lab uh, is that in some cases, Cisco gives you a troubleshooting problem but says you cannot fix this troubleshooting problem by removing any configurations. You can add configurations, but you can't take out any configurations. So not only do they want you to solve the problem, because we know that there's lots and lots of different ways to solve different problems when it comes to configuration, but not only do, not, do I not want you to, uh, uh, I don't want you to, I want you to solve the problem, but I don't want you to solve the problem in, in any way that you, you, that it'll work. What I want to do is I want you to solve the problem in my way, uh, which includes fixing the problem without removing any configurations, but you can add configurations. So uh, that, that poses a bit of a challenge for you guys because you might, you might be completely aware of what the issue is and you might say, well, I just have to remove this access list or I just have to uh, uh, you know, remove this MTU uh, on the interface and it'll fix the problem. Uh, and you won't get points for fixing that problem because you didn't solve it the way that they wanted you to solve it. So it's really, really important that you have a, a solid understanding of what all of your options are as you're going through the exercise, okay? So let's start by taking a look at our relationship, show IP OSPF neighbor. Make sure that we have all of our neighbors in our topology. I'm actually gonna probably make a quick change here uh, just to make it easier for us to understand who we're, we're talking to. Uh, this is a router two, this is router three, I believe. Uh, let's go ahead and verify that, show IP protocols. Uh, I want to change the router IDs in this case so that the uh, router IDs are easily identifiable in our, our, our debugs and our outputs. So let me go ahead and go into router OSPF uh, 1 and I'm going to change the router ID in this case to 2.2.2.2 and I'll clear the IP OSPF process. We talked about that the last time so that uh, we can identify what the uh, router ID is of this particular peer very easily in our database. All right, uh, let's also verify it on router three. Unfortunately, you obviously can't do this in the lab or you probably most likely won't be able to do this in the lab. Uh, and they might actually try to make it a little bit harder for you by using obscure values or things that maybe are not as easily recognizable uh, where you would have some sort of numbering scheme or you'd have a configuration in your topology that would make it easy for you to be able to identify certain things happening in an environment. But unfortunately, in this case, uh, with the exam, they might not let you change those things, or if you do change those things, you might not get the points that you need. So uh, even though we can do this here, uh, it may not be something that you can do in the lab, just to keep that in mind. Uh, IP router, yeah, that doesn't work very well. Uh, router OSPF1, uh, let's do router ID in this case. This is router number three, all right, and Clear IP OSPF process, yes. All right. Uh, and let's just check router four. I think router four is good to go. Show IP protocols. Yeah, it's got a router ID of 4.4.4.4. Uh, the only reason that that actually occurred <coughs> is because we do have the loopback here. Uh, actually, no, the loopback is 4.1. So it must have already been manually configured uh, in the OSPF process for the router ID of 4.4.4.4. So let's go back to show IP OSPF neighbors on router one. Uh, eventually this one will clear out, this router three one. Uh, looks like in probably about eight seconds here. Seven, five, four, three, two, one. There we go. All right, so router one has, uh, let's see, yep, we got them all. Router one has three routers uh, that it's peering with, and that makes sense. We see the topology here, and we see that we have three, three neighbor relationships. One of the things that you're gonna see in part of this discussion, if I can kind of simulate those scenarios, is that just because I have an adjacency with a peer does not mean that I'm actually exchanging information with that peer, or I'm exchanging information that's valid with that particular peer. Uh, I'm going to try and demonstrate as much as possible a lot of these different scenarios for you guys. Uh, and then I'm also going to show you a document uh, that I think is extremely useful and valuable. And that'll be part of your homework is to read that document and understand it. Uh, that talks about 
some of the most common OSPF adjacency issues that you would see, how you might be able to discover what those are and how you would fix those issues if they do arise on the exam, all right? So uh, last thing I could probably do is I could maybe just check a look at the database from Router 1. Because Router 1 is an area border router, it should have router LSAs for all of these subnets in its database. So I'll just do a quick look at that as well. Show IP OSPF database router. Uh, well, let's do this uh, section router. Yeah, I didn't like that. All right, let's do show IP OSPF database. I'll just do it. Uh, so we see the uh, in area zero, the, the link state uh, information from these two nodes within the tree. So I'm definitely getting my, my information from those two nodes in area zero. And I should have one node in area one. Well, two, and counting myself. So there's uh, router ID in area one that I'm getting six links from. And if I look at my topology, one, two, three, four, five, and then the ethernet link is six, so that looks good. And then in area two, I should be getting information from router three, 10 different links from router three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus the ethernet link between them two uh, is uh, 10. So we got, it looks like we've got full convergence here. Uh, there may be an, a quicker way to do that. Of course, you could always look at the routing table, or the routing information base. But again, I wanna kind of show you guys there's different ways to be able to get this information, all right? Now, we did talk about this the other day, and that was one of the things that I was hoping to be able to simulate. See if I can drop in a router. It gave me an error before. Okay, let me drop one in here. So this was one of the things that I was actually hoping to simulate uh, in our topology. So let me uh, go ahead and drop in a second router here. And uh, what I want to do is interconnect these guys together with a switch. So let's drop that in. All right. And let's kind of make this a little bit cleaner here. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pause the recording. So there's a reason why I went through the process of adding two additional routers in this multi-access network. And it's for the purposes of understanding the concept of the OSPF uh, state machine, finite state machine that allows us to identify uh, what kind of relationships that I have with a particular peer. We talked about this uh, quite a bit actually in our last lesson where we were talking about how OSPF kind of moves through six or seven different states depending on the type of network you have to either establish a full adjacency but in some cases the routers will maintain a two-way adjacency. Okay, So if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor in this case I can see that I have uh, a relationship with router 4, router 2, and router 3. That's interesting. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Hmm. I wonder if I did the wrong subnet address on the, on the client. Thank you. I'll use some of these. Sure. You want some? Yeah, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, I probably did the wrong subnet address. Let me check real quick. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. All right. Um, fourteen dot one. Hmm. Fourteen dot two. I wonder if I used the wrong. Uh, no, it's got to be the fourteen subnet. It is a slash 25, so that's a block of 128. So why am I not getting an adjacency? It's the 172.16 network, not the Oh my goodness. Thank you. Eh, that's a silly mistake. All right. Interface Ethernet 10 IP address 172.16.14.3. All right, and there's and lose our adjacency with six, but the other one should come up. Fourteen dot four. Uh, I've got to do, got to change my network statements here. Router OSPF one, network 
172, 16, 14.0. Oops, area zero. All right, let's change router five real quick. Mm hmm. 172.16.14.3. area 0. Show IP interface brief. All right, we should be good now. Assuming I didn't mess anything else up, uh, I should get an adjacency here on router 4. Let's go check the adjacency on router 5. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Doesn't look like it actually came up. Okay, so it's it's going through the process uh, of uh, forming an adjacency. Uh, although the extart state shouldn't last this long, but we'll see. We'll give it we'll give it a shot. Show IP OSPF neighbor. All right. So that one actually looks good. That looks like we're uh, well. We're actually we're going through. There we go. Full DR. All right. Excellent. So sorry about that. Uh, yep, loading default. Okay, show IP, but I should see, what the heck? All right, so I'm recording again. Uh, we had a mismatch in our subnet mask. I'm going to demonstrate that again a little bit later on. In fact, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and break that again later on and see if there's a way that we can find out through various debugs whether or not uh, we can identify that that's one of the issues in forming our adjacencies as far as the attributes that have to be the same for routers to be able to communicate to each other. There are actually, even today we're going to talk about a couple of them, but there are actually a multitude of things that would force or, or, or disallow routers to form an adjacency. And, and one of the things that you would have noticed as I, as I was looking at this uh, output, thinking, okay, well, they'll eventually form uh, an adjacency, is that there is a state that we're stuck in in this particular case as far as the state machine goes. Now, if you think about the actual OSPF state machine, we go from the down state to the init state to the um, uh, two-way state to the xstart state, exchange state, loading state, and full state. So we did get past the two-way state, but it's actually the xstart state in which we're trying to verify the attributes that are being shared between the routers and whether or not those attributes are acceptable for us to actually move beyond a two-way state and into the full state. So we don't actually negotiate or we don't actually verify the attributes in the two-way state. We verify the attributes in the, in the uh, xstart state. So let me actually demonstrate what we had going on here. So if I do a show IP interface brief, We've got Ethernet 1.0 that's allowing us to form an adjacency on that link. All right. If I do a show run interface Ethernet 1.0, I can see that I'm using a slash 25 prefix on that interface, and I had previously configured it with a slash 24 prefix. So we're going to change that. Interface Ethernet 1.0. We're going to do an IP address of 172.16.14.4.255.255.255.0. Uh, in this particular case, I might actually have reachability to the other interfaces. I can ping all of the other peers because my, broad, my, my subnet mask includes those particular addresses. So this is where you might be banging your head against the wall saying, well, wait a minute, I have reachability, layer three reachability to those routers, but if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I don't have any neighbors. Now let's see, if I do a debug IP OSPF adjacency, I should see some indication that the hosts are not on a common subnet. It really depends. Sometimes you'll see uh, particular outputs uh, and sometimes you won't. And in this particular case, we are getting packets from the peers on the 224.0.0.5 multicast address but we're ignoring those packets because it's, re it's identifying these as unknown neighbors. Uh, so that's kind of an ambiguous uh, error code or, or response that we're getting from syslog to indicate that we definitely are getting the, the packets from the peer, but we're not able to 
uh, but we're not able to uh, form an adjacency. So this is a debug that allows us to test the, uh, the um, state machine, but it doesn't really give us any details on why it's failing. So one of the other things we can run is a debug IP OSPF hello, and we can see if there are any parameters within the hello packet that are indicating that we have an issue. All right. Now it does actually say here, let me do an undebug all, in this particular debug, mismatched hello parameters from this peer. My dead timers and my hello timers match. So there's not an issue with the timers between these two peers. All right. Uh, but there is an issue with the subnet mask. I'm receiving a subnet mask of 128, and I have a subnet mask of uh, slash 24 configured. Uh, Ken posted a message in the chat. According to RFC 2328, a mismatch MTU configuration can cause problems while other routers, uh, exchanging DVDs while other routers can sit in the two-way state. That's absolutely correct, okay? And we're actually going to talk about an MTU mismatch later on in this lesson and how that can cause issues. And there is a fix that's actually published uh, that you should never run, and I'll explain why, especially in, in a production environment with regard to MTU mismatches. But I do kind of disagree, although the RFC states that, that we're going to be stuck in a two-way state because if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I don't have any adjacencies. Now, I could try to clear the OSPF process. Uh, clear IP OSPF process. And see if we can maybe go through that, up to that two-way state. I am debugging the NJ. Uh, no, I did an undebug all. Let's do that again. Uh, debug IP OSPF adjacency. And uh, let's do a clear IP OSPF process. And I should see an indication that we're trying to progress through different states, but we would never progress beyond a particular state. All right. So the interface is going up. Uh, let me see, show debug. All right, let's try another debug as well. Debug IP OSPF. Uh, and I probably, let me see if I look at maybe events. Uh, well, let's try adjacency. All right. Uh, clear IP OSPF process. I, I'm trying to see if there's a way for us to identify, uh, you know, which state we're getting to with these peers in this particular case. Clearly, there's a problem. I've got reachability. I can ping those peers, but I cannot uh, form an adjacency. Now, we already saw the debug IP OSPF hello helps us because that shows us misconfigured parameters within the hello packets. Uh, we could also do a Wireshark capture and we would see mismatched parameters in the hello packets. But you can see that at least these three parameters, the dead timer, the hello timer, uh, and the configured subnet mask have to, be, uh, have, to, have to be matching. So we are seeing now, we are going through part of the process of establishing an adjacency I'll just let it run for a little bit more, and then we'll go up and take a look at what state we're in. Uh, let's see, received a hello from 5555, received a hello from 4444, mismatched parameters. So it looks like we are kind of going through some of the processes of forming an adjacency. Show IP OSPF neighbor, still don't have any neighbor relationship. So we haven't, we haven't made it to the two-way state. Uh, and one of the things that we can kind of verify to see whether or not uh, whether or not the router is even recognizing these these peers is to take a look at the hello packet that's maybe coming from router one. So let me go ahead and do a debug or a packet capture on that interface, and I want to look at the hello packets that are coming from router one. Uh, well, it's on a Hmm. I guess I, let me let me do the other interface. I can I can do it from router four. Uh, well, all I'm looking for in the particular case of the hello packets is does router four even recognize 
that router five and six could be peers in this particular case. And I know that the RFC states that we should at least get to the two-way state, but that hasn't been my experience. My experience has been if there's a, uh, some fundamental parameter mismatches in the hello packets, that we won't even get to the two-way state because usually the two-way state would indicate that we have some agreement upon the parameters that we're using to match. So here's a hello packet from router four. And if I go into the hello packet, one of the things that I should see listed in the hello packet is uh, a list of my peers. Uh, and let me see, there's my mask. And let's take a look. Uh, so I should be seeing a list of my peers. And it should be in the hello packet here. Let me make sure I have a, an adjacency on router four. I should at least show IP OSPF neighbor. All right. Um, well, that's interesting. Router five is showing up as a neighbor. Router six is not. I think, I, oh, it's because I fixed router five. That would make sense. I didn't fix router six, but I, I broke router six, but I fixed router five. So obviously that's going to show up as a peer. Um, but I should be seeing show IP OSPF neighbor. Yeah, something else is going on here. Because router, no, no, that makes sense. Yep, because remember, I'm only looking at the multi-axis network. So what I should be seeing in the hello packets from router four is I should be seeing these guys listed as neighbors. What I was trying to see though is whether or not we were actually seeing, from the case of uh, router four, whether or not we were actually seeing the uh, router five or router six show up in the list of neighbors. Uh, and I'm not actually seeing it at all, which is kind of interesting. Let me try and clear the process on router four. And let's go ahead and, and take a look at our hello packets again. So router four, let's stop the capture here. Uh, this is the original hello packet. What I'm looking for is a list of the peers that router four recognizes as part of, well, what we call its neighbor list. Uh, and that should be listed here. I'm not, I'm not sure why I'm not seeing it. Remember when we talked about, uh, oh, I see why, yep. That is interesting. Oh, <laughs> see, it's been a long day for me, guys. I'm sitting here thinking that 14.4 is router 4. 14.4 is actually router 6. I need to look at dot one. Dot one's hello packets, sorry. We'll get there eventually. So. Look at router one's packets, and sure enough, in this particular case, that's exactly what I was looking for. What are my active neighbors on, in my hello packet? I always list my active neighbors in the hello packet when I've realized that I can actually form an adjacency with that particular peer. And in this case, 4.4.4.4 and 5.5.5.5 are showing up, but not 6.6.6.6. .6 and the reason I brought that up, Ken, is because in order for us to form a two-way adjacency, router six's router ID would have to be in that list. Otherwise, there's no, no way for us to form a two-way adjacency. Um, so in this particular case, uh, that, that uh, I'm assuming you've got that uh, quote from the RFC, con uh, configurations can cause problems with exchanging DVDs, mismatch MTUs, while the router can sit in a two-way state. Uh, so that's, that's one issue, but it's not all the issues. Uh, an MTU mismatch is not a, an OSPF property. An MTU mismatch is an issue with the physical interface configuration. MTU sizes don't actually have anything to do with uh, the actual parameters of OSPF. In fact, you will, uh, MTU values are transmitted but you'll notice here in the, in the uh, actual hello packet that MTU is not really listed as a property 
of, of the OSPF packet itself. We've got hello interval, we've got subnet mask, uh, we've got area ID, router, router ID, packet length, and so on. So MTU is more of a physical characteristic, which we would actually be able to recognize based on other, other uh, characteristics of the PDU that's being sent back and forth between the peers, but it's not actually something that's propagated within the hello packet. There are other places that the MTU can be referenced in OSPF, but it's not in the hello packet. So um, it is, uh, it's an interesting concept, uh, but we were never, never able to get to a two-way state in this particular case because the network mask is one of those properties that's propagated within the hello packet and because the network mask doesn't match we were not able to even move beyond the two-way state. Uh, so that's obviously something we can very easily fix. Go ahead and change the subnet mask on the router and, and we would get our adjacency back. So let me go to router 6, config T, interface Ethernet 1.0, IP address 172.16.14.4, uh, in this case, 255.255.255.128. All right, so now we're seeing that we're progressing through the different, the exchange state, the loading state, the full state, and then eventually we, we get into our um, full state, which we see right here. Synchronized here, synchronized here, uh, and we've got, uh, now we've just got our normal um, OSPF uh, multicast pra uh, processes running. So let's do an undebug all. All right. We finally got there. Thank you for bringing that up though, Ken, because that's a, that's a really important concept. And I'm actually going to cover the MTU piece again in more detail as we move through the lesson here. Um, so we saw a few debugs uh, and, and obviously these are going to be some of those commands that you need to be really familiar with. The debug, uh, debug IP, OSPF adjacency, that'll allow me to go through the state machine, debug IP, uh, hello, or debug, not debug, debug IP OSPF hello is going to allow me to identify maybe some parameter mismatches between the different peers. Uh, and you can run various debugs, but you don't want to get stuck on the exam, uh, you know, kind of floundering. You need to have an idea of what debugs are going to provide you the most uh, the quickest uh, possibility of finding the issue and then finally resolving that issue as part of the process. All right? So a lot of the issues that come within OSPF are going to happen either before the two-way state or they're going to happen before the xstart state. Once you move beyond the xstart state, then you can, uh, then you can pretty much I wouldn't say assume, but you can pretty much be assured that we're going we're gonna to progress to the full state eventually. There are multiple types of MTUs. Uh, there's a layer 2 MTU, layer 3 MTU, uh, and they don't really actually have anything to do with the routing protocol. But the problem is when you have an MTU mismatch in OSPF, let me turn off these debugs. When you have an, uh, uh, an MTU mismatch in OSPF, uh, it has to do with how the the advertisements are being sent and how they're being packaged within the frame. Uh, and if we have jumbo frames configured on one interface uh, and uh, another OSPF router is operating at a normal 1500 byte configuration, say for Ethernet, and it receives that jumbo frame, which includes the OSPF information, it's not going to be able to process that information and put it into its database because uh, essentially the, the, the client is going to look at that as a malformed frame. It has nothing really to do with OSPF in this case. It has to do with the mismatched MTU sizes on the interfaces and how we process data. All right, um, so you do make a good point. It doesn't really have anything to do with the actual routing protocol in this case. All right, so um, let's take a look at maybe uh, some of the other things that could occur that would force us, actually, <laughs> the whole point of me adding these other routers here, uh, I wanted to show you what, what a good state looks like from a routing perspective. So if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, you can see that uh, we've formed a full adjacency with everybody from router one's perspective. 
But if I go investigate that on router 2, actually it would be, well, let's start with router 6. Show IP OSPF neighbor. You can see that in this particular case between router 4 and router 6, we've only, we're only, only maintaining a two-way state. Do you guys remember why that is? What is it about this topology, which is why I had to add additional routers, but what is it about this topology that forces router 4 and router 6 to maintain a two-way adjacency as opposed to going into a full adjacency? They're not DRs, right. They're not DRs, they're not BDRs, they're DR others. And one DR other will form a two-way adjacency with another DR other because they're not actually sharing routing information. They're aware that they exist, they're aware that they, they, they are participating in the same topology and they can become full neighbors if they need to because all of the properties and the uh, attributes that need to, add, uh, to need to match are correct, but they're not exchanging information directly with each other. So it's not necessarily a bad thing if you are, are, are moving in or you're staying in a two-way state, but you don't want to be stuck in that two-way state. Usually, um, that'll never happen. Uh, you're not going to just stay in a two-way state because of a misconfiguration or an error. You'll probably go down, then you'll go to a knit, then you'll go to two-way, then you'll go down, then you go to a knit, then you go to two-way. So you'll be cycling through several different states continuously in the, in, the, in the hopes that you can finally form an adjacency. All right? If you don't get to the two-way state, 99% of the time, it's going to be some sort of transport-related problem. Maybe you have uh, the wrong next-top server mapping and a DMVPN network. There may be an ACL that's blocking OSPF traffic, but it's got to be some sort of underlying transport problem. So you need to start troubleshooting the transport problem. All right. And again, in a multi-access network, we could stop at a two-way state if we have DR others and so on. Uh, X start, you're not typically stuck in the X start state. Uh, we saw that when uh, mismatched parameters. Um, but usually if you do get stuck in an X start state or even an exchange state, that's almost always going to be related to some sort of attribute problem, which we demonstrated uh, initially through the fault of me misconfiguring the network, uh, but, uh, and then intentionally reduplicated that problem. But, uh, uh, the, you know, so if you get stuck in an X start state or you get stuck in an exchange state, Start looking at the attributes, start doing your debugs, especially the adjacency and the hello debugs, to make sure that the attributes are, are appropriate for the peers to be, be able to uh, you know, fully establish their adjacency. All right? Now, what are those attributes? And, and, and what kind of attributes need to be the same versus what attributes need to be unique, right? Well, one of the most common issues that we see in OSPF is that the router IDs are not unique. Uh, and if you have mismatched router IDs, or excuse me, duplicate router IDs, that can cause all kinds of, of trouble in your domain. Uh, we'll actually go ahead and duplicate that here in a second. Interface IP address, we also saw that. Uh, the IP addresses can't be duplicate. Uh, the subnet masks have to be common, but the, you can't have a duplicate IP address on an interface that's participating in OSPF. Again, that's more of a transport-related issue. So I'm going to come into router 6 here. And I am going to break OSPF again uh, so that we can see the symptoms of what it is, uh, well, essentially what, what will breaking uh, OSPF in this particular way cause to happen. So in this case, we're going to go into router OSPF one, and we're going to say router ID 1.1.1.1. I'll do a clear IP OSPF process and let the games begin. All right? So initially, um, we may or may not see an issue. We can see here we got a syslog message, OSPF detected a duplicate router ID from 14.1, which is the physical IP address of the peer, on Ethernet 1.0. One of the things to keep in mind, guys, on the lab, 
they might actually, in the troubleshooting section, they might actually disable syslog so that you cannot see these very obvious message, messages that would allow you to fix the problem very quickly. So again, you have to be able to uh, run debugs. Uh, it's unlikely that they would disallow any particular type of debug, uh, but you have to be able to run these debugs and uh, uh, do these different verifications without uh, maybe some other tool that normally would be available to you. All right, I'm not going to fix the problem right now, but let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other debugs again. So let's do a debug IP OSPF adjacency, uh, which again is probably one of the most common types of debugs that you would end up running, and see if we see anything. Uh, actually, we probably won't. Let me do a clear IP OSPF process, reset the process, and see if we can see any, any kind of uh, message in this case indicating that there is some sort of duplicate router ID. So uh, peers down, router 5, router 1. Um, so we're not actually seeing in this particular case. Uh, we do see that the address is dead for 1.1.1.1. So we're not actually seeing in this particular output anything that's glaringly obvious that indicates that the router IDs are, are we have two common router IDs. Let me do a show IP OSPF database and see if we see anything in there. Oops. Mm -hmm. Show IP OSPF. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, six, router six is 14.4. Uh, let's see. Let me see right here. 14.4. Wow. Yeah. So this is 14.3, which is router 5. Uh, this is 14.4, which is router 1. Actually, that's actually kind of interesting because 14.4 uh, is, this is supposed to indicate the address of the peer, right? So 5.5.5.5 is in fact 14.3, but 1.1.1.1 is not 14.4. See what I'm saying? Router 1 is 14.1. Show IP interface brief. Router 1 is 14.1. Show IP protocols uh, is router ID is 1.1.1.1. So that does indicate that there's obviously some sort of overlap uh, in this particular case. It's not glaringly obvious, but if you're familiar with your topology, you might say, well, wait a minute, that's not the right address for that router ID. Okay. Uh, you'll notice also here, of course, I'm, I keep getting these, these duplicate router ID messages. That's just a normal syslog function. Uh, let me see if there's another debug. Let's try a, a hello. Uh, the router ID is also going to be sent and received in the hello packets. So received a hello, received a hello. I'm just curious if I'm going to be sending a hello uh, using multicast if, if it would advertise or identify the router ID. Um, so it looks like this would have been the time that I would have received the hello from the peer. So about every 10 seconds, I should get this message popping up indicating that I'm getting a duplicate router ID. So I'm essentially ignoring that information from that peer because my router ID is 1.1.1.1 and you're trying to advertise information to me with a router ID of 1.1.1.1 as well. All right. Uh, let me see. Show IP OSPF database. So this is interesting. Uh, let me do an undebug all real quick. I want to show you something real quick. So it does look like we have information that's contained in the database for that particular peer. Show IP OSPF database 1.1.1.1. Oh, sorry, router. I want to see if, if this is information that actually is on router 1 
or if this is information on myself. Yep, it's information on myself. So I, I'm, I'm putting information into my database for router ID 1.1.1.1, but my information is overriding any information I would have received from the peer. So if I go to router 1, show IP OSPF database, router 1.1.1.1, I would expect in this case to see a database mismatch because 1.1 is attached to router 1. Now I'm very curious to see how that would look, for example, on another router. So router 5, the problem is between router 6 and router 1, how does that look on router 5? Right? Let's give it a shot. I imagine that would probably give me some more details about it, or it might even kind of just indicate the same, same kind of message. It's a periodic thing, so we kind of have to wait a little bit to see if we're seeing anything. Um, yeah, that's our normal syslog message. And let's see, hello, flood, events, capability. Yeah, I don't really see any other debugs that would really, maybe SPF because uh, with SPF, uh, well, that's really kind of just after we've exchanged everything, we're running our SPF algorithm to converge or, or to, uh, to, to calculate our database, but I do want to see one other thing. So I didn't see anything, Tim, in that debug. So this is a little bit more challenging. Without that syslog message, it might be a little bit difficult. Let's go to router four, show IP OSPF neighbor. And this, this would definitely be an indication, <laughs> a clear indication that you've got an issue because we, there's no reason why we, see, we should see that router ID listed twice in a neighbor, neighbor table. I'm curious how that's going to affect our overall topology database, show IP OSPF database. And I do see advertising router here, two links in area zero. And uh, we're also getting netlink state LSAs, which are type two LSAs from 1.1.1.1. And we're also getting type three LSAs from 1.1.1.1, which is uh, our ABR. These are our summary LSAs that get generated on our area border router. Show IP OSPF database, router 1.1.1.1. All right, so it looks like router 1, 1 in this particular case for the type 1 LSAs in area 0. Um, and let's see about the summaries. Uh, let's do summary. Uh, 12. So in this case, it looks like router 1, 1 in this case as well. So we're not getting anything from router 6. So, but clearly this would be an indication that there's definitely a misconfiguration because the neighbor ID is the router ID for our peers. The neighbor ID is actually the router ID. Uh, what I had hoped to see, um, and maybe I, can, maybe I can generate this a different way, but what I had hoped to see was routes being learned by OSPF, but not being added to the database because of a misconfiguration issue. So I might be able to configure that a different way and show you guys that in a little bit here. So let's go ahead and fix the problem. and talk about maybe some of the other things that we might see happening. Uh, I didn't quite finish the discussion about what doesn't, can't match versus what can match or must match. Uh, and we already talked about the router ID must be unique. The interface IP address participating in the subnet must be unique. But what about the common adjacency attributes that we have to have? One of the attributes that we see in the hello packet is the area that the hello packet is coming from, area ID here. So there's no way for two routers to form an adjacency 
if those interfaces are in, an, in the wrong area. So let's simulate that problem and see what that, how that manifests itself in our topology. Router OSPF1. No network, uh, 172.16. 14.0, 0, 0.0.0.255, 0 .0 area 0, and let's do, let's put that interface into area 10. All right, so I put the interface uh, on the Ethernet side into area 10. Already we're again seeing syslog messages that indicate that we've receiving hello packets on that interface from different routers. This is router five, this is router two or four. Uh, I'm receiving hello packets from these various routers, but the hello packets have an area ID of quad zero, not 10. Uh, and certainly I should see this in a debug. Uh, debug IP OSPF neighbor, or OSPF hello. And I don't know, maybe we'll see this, maybe we won't, but I think I should, we should see um, some mismatched parameters again in the hello packets. Nope, we're not actually seeing it. I'm sending hello. These are the hellos that I'm receiving, but unlike where we saw the issue with the dead timers and hello timers and the, and the subnet mask, I'm not seeing a specific message that indicates, outside of the syslog message, I'm not seeing a specific message that indicates that there's an area ID mismatch. Let's try a debug IP OSPF adjacency and see if we see any kind of message indicating a, an area ID mismatch. Now I am seeing Sending hello from area 10, but was I seeing that before? Yeah, that was our debug hello. So again, I'm not really seeing on the inbound side, other than the syslog message that's being generated from the trap or from the, from the misconfiguration, I'm not, seeing, I'm not seeing receiving a hello uh, from this peer on area zero. All right, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge if, if they happen to, and I don't, I don't recall them doing this in my lab, but if they happen to dis, uh, you know, to dis, uh, mis, or disallow the use of syslog messages, or they might have logging disabled and you, you, you need to be able to turn it on to be able to get these verbose messages that are coming out, you might not know that there's an area ID mismatch in that particular uh, interface. Obviously, if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I'm not gonna have adjacencies. Uh, let me do an undebug all. So you can do some static verification you can do a show IP OSPF interface brief, for example, and you'd be able to very quickly identify that that particular interface is not in the correct area. All right, so debugs may not be your quickest way to a particular solution, uh, but they can be very helpful. All right, let's fix that problem. Uh, interface Ethernet 1.0, sorry. Actually, let's just do it that way. IP OSPF1 area zero. That's gonna override uh, the network statement and we'll get our adjacencies back. But it should have done that anyway, so I didn't have to worry about those, those stupid network statements, but okay. What are some of the other things that have to match? Hello and dead timers have to match? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there are, there are uh, some other topics that we'll have in future lessons where we talk about different network types uh, but that can play havoc on our configuration. The network address has to match. Uh, the interface MTU has to match. The network type has to match. Now that's an interesting concept. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not going into detail on a lot of these because we're going to see these as we start to explore some of the more advanced configurations of OSPF. Uh, network type doesn't actually technically have to match. So let me, uh, let me demonstrate that concept because this will also allow me to demonstrate the idea of, of uh, timers as well. So we're running a multi-axis network between R1 and R2. And this cloud here is, is just a switch that I changed the icon to a cloud to. But this is an Ethernet subnet. So it's a broadcast network, which means that OSPF is going to interpret that interface as a broadcast network. And if I go into router two, 
and I do a show IP OSPF interface, you can see that uh, Ethernet 1.0 is actually, in fact, being identified as a broadcast network. Now, I do have the ability to go into those Ethernet interfaces and change the network type. I have five different network types, broadcast, non-broadcast, point to multipoint, point to point, and then finally, point to multipoint, non-broadcast. The interesting thing about these different network types, and you may choose to use these different network types depending on the underlying transport. Uh, maybe it's a frame relay, multipoint configuration, maybe it's a multipoint DMVPN configuration. But when you change these network types, oftentimes it's going to change the behavior of OSPF on those particular links. So if I do IP OSPF network point to point in this particular case, on this multi-access network, let's take a look at how that affects the overall process. Show IP OSPF neighbor, so I do still have a full adjacency with router one. So that's why I'm saying network type doesn't technically have to match, um, but it could cause some issues. All right, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute here. So let me do show IP OSPF database and make sure our database is intact. It looks like it is. Uh, let me just do a router real quick. Ah, interesting. We see a problem here. Do you guys see the problem? Show IP route OSPF. I have no routes, which is really, really interesting because if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I have a full adjacency with the peer but I'm not getting any routes. Any idea why that's happening? Any thoughts? And by the way, the database did show me that as well, okay? So if I look at the uh, database for my point-to-point -point router, show IP, well actually let me just verify one other thing. Show IP OSPF interface, we can see the timers on this interface are 10 and 40, and if I go to router one, show IP OSPF interface. On this particular case, uh, which interface are we using on this guy? Ethernet 1.1. Uh, Ethernet 1.1 is also 10 and 40. So it's not a timer problem. Yeah, go ahead. Can I show you what? Uh, all right, if I go into router six and I do a show IP OSPF interface brief, I'm still uh, running OSPF on both of my interfaces here. I didn't change that. Uh, same thing on router one, show IP OSPF interface brief. Uh, I'm running OSPF on my Ethernet 1.1. Uh, I actually have an adjacency. Uh, got cost, got IP address, right? So. The thing that I wanted to point out in this particular case, show IP, nope, sorry, wrong router, router two, is show IP, show IP OSPF neighbor. I've got a full adjacency, so I would expect, well, it does have to do with the network type, but not, well, I mean, yeah, it absolutely has to do with the network type, but I'm going to explain why here in a second. Um, if I do a show IP OSPF database, I am actually learning all of the information from router one. I'm getting my links from router one. There's one link uh, in, in area one. I'm getting all of my type three routes from router one. But you'll notice here if I drill down into these routes, for example, if I want to see what this link is, which by the way should be uh, based on our topology, should be this link right here, okay, which is the 172.16.12 subnet. If I drill down into that, show IP OSPF database router 1.1.1.1, uh, advertising router is not reachable in the topology. So I'm, I'm, I've got an adjacency, but I can't resolve 
the the node in the in the spanning uh, in the tree. I can see the link state IDs. I know about the router in the database. Uh, all the other routers are adjacent and so on. Uh, and I'm even adjacent with the point-to-point -point router, but I can't recurse with the link state database because of how reachability is conducted in with these OSPF peers. Router one is acting is treating that network type as broadcast which means it's actually advertising network layer reachability information using type 2 LSAs. But because router 1, or excuse me, router 2 is point to point, it doesn't look at type 2 LSAs. It doesn't understand type 2 LSAs because type 2 LSAs are, uh, are, are only sent by DRs on multi-access networks. So uh, if I look at router 1's database here, hold on one second. If I look at router 2's database, excuse me, show IP OSPF database, you don't see uh, in this case, actually we do see in this case type 2 LSAs coming in, but I don't understand what type 2 LSAs are because I'm not, I'm a point-to-point I'm a -point router, all right? One router is using type 2 LSAs, the other one's not, which basically stops router 2 from resolving the actual spanning tra or, or, or tree itself, all right? Uh, it basically means that the router can't resolve the tree. So if we do uh, a, maybe a, a quick, uh, in this case, show IP OSPF, oops, sorry. Show IP OSPF uh, database router and I'm going to pipe out, uh, include unreachable, or sorry, reachable. We can see that none of uh, the routes are reachable, right? And in fact, we see, we see the output indicating that there's a problem. The way we fix this, well, we simply match up the network types. It doesn't really matter. So, so my point is, when I said that network types have to match, this manifests itself in a different kind of way. We can still form an adjacency with the peer. We can actually even exchange our DVDs and, and, and information about our database, but we cannot resolve the tree for that particular peer because of the LSA types that are being exchanged between the peers. So if I come in here and I say, okay, config T, uh, interface Ethernet 1.1, IP OSPF, network point to point. We're not going to really see, uh, you know, our, our adjacency will, will resync, but now if I do a show IP route, I'm getting all of my OSPF routes again because I can now resolve the tree. Does that make sense? So uh, network type is a, is a big deal. When you're dealing with any issues on the exam itself, a lot of times it simply comes down to semantics, like I said, with, with uh, the configuration. On the troubleshooting section of the exam, you may or may not be allowed to remove different configurations. It really depends on the question. So like I said, there could be multiple solutions to a problem. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's change the other network type to match, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's to, to simply not change the network type. And, fix or change, remove the network type from one side or add the network type to another side and so on. All right, so they may want you to add commands to fix the problem. They may want you to take away commands to fix the problem. But uh, in any event, it's, it's something that we have to do. Now, what if I change this to a different issue? Let's say I go into router one in this case and go into interface ethernet one one and I say IP OSPF network type point to multipoint now. All right. Uh, and it looks like the neighbor went down, but it did not resync. Now, essentially, point to multipoint just basically means that you can form multiple adjacencies on that interface. Uh, typically, we'll use this in a hub and spoke design, and we'll do the point to multipoint configuration on the, on the hub side and point to point configuration on the spoke side. But now I'm, I'm not forming an adjacency again, so if I do a debug 
IP OSPF hello. Let's see if we can see anything that indicates the problem in this particular case. I should be able to see uh, quickly. Yep, on debug all. And sure enough, I received a hello on 1.1 .1 or 1 slash 1 from router 2. Mismatched hello parameters. The dead timer that I have or received was uh, 40. The one that I have configured is 120. The hello time I received is 10. The one I have configured is 30. So if I do a show IP OSPF interface, Ethernet 1.1, you can see that in a point to multi point network type, the timers change. And this is uh, by design point to multi point broadcast networks, or, or non-broadcast multi-axis essentially, uh, we change the dead timers and the hello timers um, uh, to mismatch. So in this case, they might say, well, you, you have to fix this problem, but you can't change the network type. So you have to come up with a different way of fixing the problem. And in this case, we would just simply go into the interface and say IP OSPF hello interval and change it to 10 and our adjacency will reform because we're now, we now have matched timers between the peers. All right? So there's lots and lots of ways to tackle these issues. Uh, my, my, my whole point about this entire conversation, though, and the reason this lesson is so important, is you have to have an approach to be able to find these issues as quickly as possible. All right? Uh, let's see, what else do I want to mention here? Uh, I'm just looking at my notes here for my lesson plan. I kind of jumped around a little bit, but uh, yeah, maybe we, we need to make sure that we look at all the nodes in the list. Like I said, you might not get syslog messages on the, on the test, so you have to be able to find uh, you know, issues another way. Uh, and it could be related to a reachability problem or it could be related to a misconfiguration. Uh, actually, let me show you one other potential problem. So config t ip access dash list extended break OSPF. All right. Uh, and I'm going to do a deny OSPF, uh, OSPF any any, and permit ip any any. All right. Now, clearly, this is going to be an issue because uh, I'm not going to be able to receive any more hello packets. Uh, eventually, the neighbor will disappear. I've got to wait for the hold timer to expire. But eventually, that neighbor will disappear. Let me apply the configuration. Show IP interface brief. Uh, config T interface Ethernet 1.0. IP access group. Uh, break OSPF in. And it's entirely possible that on the troubleshooting section, they would actually do something like this, where we would actually block a port or a protocol, uh, and that would prevent the protocol from operating correctly. Show IP OSPF neighbor. All right, 15, 13, 12. So I'm waiting for the dead timer to expire, uh, and we should see that the, 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 the peer will go away after that dead timer expires. I already know it will because I should never go below whatever, uh, whatever my, uh, my incremental update timer is. So if, I, if my dead timer is 30 seconds or 40 seconds and my hello timer is 10 seconds, I should never really see that number go below 30. But because I saw it counting all the way down to zero, I knew that that adjacency was going to fail. All right. So this is a particular problem because it's not really an OSPF issue. A do a debug IP OSPF hello, that's not going to help me. If I, if I, because uh, it's, it's basically essentially in this case a transport issue, it's not a uh, OSPF misconfiguration. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. Uh, and how do you deal with that? Obviously, you can do show runs, but, but quite frankly, show runs, uh, if you're doing show runs to try and parse configs to figure something out, you will never have enough time to finish the exercise. So there's a couple of things we could potentially do here. I could maybe ping 224.0.0.5 to see if anybody might possibly respond to that. And I do see that I, I, I get a reply from a couple of different routers 
which is router one. So I can see that multicast at least is not being blocked in this particular case. Um, I got a reply from uh, two different addresses on the same peer, but uh, I can see, for example, that multicast is not being blocked in this case because that could be another thing. They could have an access list that's filtering out multicast. Um, and, uh, and then maybe you finally discover, show uh, IP OSPF interface brief, we can see that OSPF is running on the interface. And then finally, I do a show IP interface Ethernet 1.0. And I see that there is an access list applied. But now, maybe in the instructions, they somehow indicate you cannot remove any configurations. So you're like, well, wait a minute. If I can't remove any configurations, how do I fix the problem? Uh, Mike asked a question, would removing the ACL be a way to fix it, or do you need to add the neighbor command? Let's say, uh, obviously, removing the ACL would fix the problem, right? Uh, adding a neighbor command would not fix the problem because we're, bro we're blocking the protocol. It's based on protocol ID. So even though I might be uni doing unicast hellos and, and I'm sending uh, uh, packets back and forth by adding the, the neighbor manually, it's still blocking based on the protocol stack. It's blocking protocol 89. So that wouldn't really help me in that case. What I would have to do... Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, and that, and that actually is a good point, right? You ping multicast, it doesn't work. Uh, then you kind of identify that multicast is no longer working. Um, and uh, so you say, okay, well, let's go ahead and bypass the multicast by going into router OSPF. Oops, config T. Router OSPF1. And using the neighbor command and then statically configuring the neighbor ID, which would be the address of this interface. Let's go ahead and verify that. Show IP interface brief, uh, which is this address right here. So I can statically configure the neighbor. All right. Uh, interesting. It didn't let me do that because it's only allowed on NVMA networks. So see, now that brings in another element to the configuration. So I would have to go into interface Ethernet 1, 0, and I'd have to say IP OSPF. IP OSPF network non-broadcast. All right. Now, if I do a show IP OSPF interface, uh, Ethernet 1.0, now my timers are screwed up again. So I might have to do an IP OSPF hello interval 10 and then go into router OSPF 1. And then I can specify my neighbor. Right? So, <laughs> you may be able to, you may, you may uh, figure it out. Okay, well, if I just specify my neighbor statically, then I'm going to be able to fix the problem. But because my network type wasn't non-broadcast, you're not allowed to specify the neighbor statically because only non-broadcast networks can't do automatic neighbor discovery. Uh, so I had to go and change my network type to non-broadcast, but then that changed my timers. So I had to go and change my timers so that my timers would match between the peers. All right. Still, it's not going to fix the problem in this case because we're simply blocking the entire protocol itself. Yes. How did you read my mind, Tim? You read my mind. Uh, so if I do a show IP access dash list, we can see that it is a uh, it, it's, an, it's a named access list. Pretty much every access list has sequence numbers these days. So what you may end up doing on the test is going IP access dash list extended break OSPF. And believe it or not, the solution would be to permit OSPF any any before you block OSPF. Right? Um, and, and uh, that would fix the problem, right? So we're permitting OSPF before it's being blocked, and now our adjacencies will reform, maybe. I've kind of 
changed a whole bunch of configurations here. But we should, yeah, we're going through the process of establishing our adjacency. Now, uh, we have another problem again because we've got kind of a, a mismatch in, in our network types. The router 2 is NBMA, which is non-broadcast but multi-access. And the router on the left, router 1, okay, well, it did work. Oh, that's right, because I forgot it wasn't point to point. If I do a show run, interface Ethernet 1, 1, it's point to multipoint. Point to multipoint uh, allows multiple adjacencies over the same broadcast domain. So uh, it's essentially a multi-access network as well. I was going to say one is point to point, which means no DR, BDR election. But if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, because uh, this, well, that's interesting. So we're going to run into the same problem in this case where it is point to multipoint, but in the case of OSPF, point to anything means no DR, BDR election. So if you have a network type of point to anything, it means no DR, BDR election. Uh, which means, again, now I've got to change my network type to kind of sync up with the other router. All right. So we're going to see a lot of this other stuff when we're going through uh, some of the other configurations. Actually, let me fix this problem here. Oops. Uh, let's see. Config T, interface Ethernet 1, 1, IP OSPF network non-broadcast and IP OSPF hello interval 10. So now we've kind of got a synchronized configuration and we should get our adjacencies. Ah, we're not going to get our adjacencies because I now have to specify the neighbor because I'm no longer sending hello packets. Actually I'm going to let that run for a second because I may, we may see something happen that I, that, that, that it's a possibility. All right. Um, let me show you guys the uh, document that I want you to take a look at tonight, or at some point, all right? Uh, I'm trying to figure out uh, what it was called. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to find it. Uh, let me open up Google and see if I can just find it that way. There's a, there's a specific document that Cisco has published that I definitely want you guys to take a look at. Uh, and uh, it's basically, why won't my routers form an adjacency? Uh, why won't my OSPF routers form an adjacency? I think that's it. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, that's not it. Uh, hold on. So the document that I found here, I, I uh, did a search on. Why are some of the OSPF routes in the database but not in the routing table? Uh, and again, we've already talked about some of these scenarios, but not all of them. Uh, and we're going to see some of these other scenarios as we go through, uh, as we go through some of the other advanced configurations in our in our uh, topology. Uh, or in our OSPF journey, if you will. Okay, so I'll save this. Uh, I'm going to leave it right now, but I'll go ahead and save this in in the uh, in the books folder uh, or the reference documentation folder, so you guys can take a look at this. Definitely be familiar with some of these scenarios. It's a little bit of an older document, but it still applies in a lot of different cases. All right. The last thing I want to show you guys before we kind of wrap up for this evening is what happens if I have an MTU mismatch on my interfaces. It is entirely possible that one interface could have a different MTU than the other interfaces in my topology based on its, its local physical LAN connectivity. So if I go into router 4, for example, and I do a config T, interface Ethernet 1.0, and I just simply put in an MTU of, say, 9,000 bytes, 
you know, let's do 3,000. Mm, IPMTU. Ah, well, let me change it there. Let's make it lower. Uh, IPMTU, uh, 1,000 bytes, okay? Now, eventually what's going to happen is the adjacencies, and I'm going to go ahead and kickstart the process, but the adjacencies would uh, essentially fail, and we would lose our adjacencies and our, our neighbor relationships. Now, if I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I can see that I'm actually able to move beyond the two-way state but I'm stuck in the xstart state, which is kind of interesting because that means that our attributes are okay. We were able to negotiate the appropriate attributes between the peers, but we cannot move beyond the xstart state because of that MTU mismatch. If I do a debug IP OSPF uh, hello, that's probably not gonna show me much, but if I do a debug IP OSPF adjacency, I might even see a reference to MTU mismatches on the, um, on the interface, and sure enough, we do. And that's the debug adjacency option here. I received a larger MTU, larger MTU, larger MTU, larger MTU. So even though it's not necessarily part of the hello packet, we can see that during the database descriptor exchange that we are getting MTU information in the DBDs, which means that uh, even though it's not an attribute necessarily, it is something that is advertised as part of those database descriptors that are being sent back and forth between the peers. Now I could do something like this, interface Ethernet 1.0, and I could do IP OSPF MTU ignore, and I'll just do that on one other router here, config T interface Ethernet 1.0, IP, you have to do it on both sides, IP, uh, OSPF, MTU, ignore. And those routers will now be able to move beyond the xstart state and then kind of go into the full state. This may be the solution that's required on the lab on the exam, but it should never be a solution in the real world because you're going to have all kinds of issues synchronizing information uh, and you're going to have issues uh, kind of... Uh, you know, working out the database, if you will, between the peers. Show IP OSPF neighbor. So we can see in this case with uh, a router one to router four that I was able to proceed beyond the xstart state and then move into the full state in this case. Router four is still having problems with the other routers. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Actually, it looks like we were able to get beyond, uh, so if we just ignored it on one side, uh, we were able to still form an adjacency. Let's do our show IP OSPF database and see if there's any indication of an issue with the database from router 5. Uh, show IP OSPF database router 5.5.5.5 uh, doesn't look like it. Looks like we're actually receiving the prefixes uh, if I do a show IP route. Uh, I'm seeing the 5.0 prefix come in as an OSPF route. So it, it didn't necessarily cause an issue with OSPF because MTU is not really an OSPF issue. MTU is a transport issue. Uh, so the, the, the issue might manifest itself in kind of some other weird things happening in the topology when you're actually trying to route datagrams. Occasionally you might see an issue even when database uh, information is being exchanged as well. All right, so we're not quite done with our troubleshooting discussion. We are for tonight. Uh, we got a lot more stuff to talk about with uh, troubleshooting uh, with regard to things like special area types and authentication and so on and how do we verify whether or not we have authentication parameter mismatches or, or the stub flag doesn't match in an OSPF hello packet and stuff like that. But we're going to talk about troubleshooting those scenarios when we get into those lessons uh, over the next couple weeks, okay? So we'll go ahead and wrap it up for tonight.